Duncan McCracken is the technical director of Mondata Proprietary Limited, an organisation leading the way in creating installation packages for OS X deployment solutions. Um, Duncan's been working for over 20 years with Apple and Associated Products as, as a consultant and has worked in some of the leading integration companies at home in Australia and around the world. Um, Duncan's known for his willingness to adapt to new playing fields through embracing different technologies and his knack for creating modular reusable solutions. Um, Duncan also uh, presents at many of the conferences around the world. Uh, I, I've seen Duncan at Maxis Admin and Mac IT, and you've also presented at a couple of others. So um, it's great to have you here presenting, um, and this is Duncan's third time presenting at XWorld. So practical troubleshooting. Thanks, Duncan. Thank you. Um, so I, I look around, I see a lot of people who are familiar faces, some people who don't know me. Um, this, um, this year, is something different for me. I'm not doing an actual technical talk, so it's not going to need to be played back in slow motion. Um, <laughs> most of them usually do, but that's fine. Um, this, is, this is about troubleshooting. So this is something I see every day, and I, I was wondering about what the title of this talk should actually be. Um, <laughs> probably closer, <laughs> um, because Seriously, it, it seems like it should be obvious, um, and why am I talking about it? But a lot of the time, you make the mistakes yourself. You you really don't um, you don't get back to basics and think. So anyway, you know, <laughs> here we are. You know, I'm human like everybody else. We we all do these things. So it may seem preachy. I, I may seem angry because these things can be frustrating, but. Um, you need to learn from it. So here we are, back at the start again. And this is, I guess, um, where it all comes from. And it's, it's effectively one man's opinion. Um, but it kind of works for me. And I think I should share that with everybody. Step number one, don't panic. It is incredibly rare that you will be working in a situation where if something's not working, somebody is going to die. Now, with the exception of John Rhodes, who I think would be the closest to that point, <laughs> um, the rest of us are OK. People are going to get pissed off. Hell, I just said I'm angry all the time. That's normal. Um, what you are going to get when you come up with a problem is pressure. Panic, stress, anger, frustration, they're reactions. You have to keep it in perspective. Step number one is not a technical thing. It's an emotional response to your issue. Step number two, never assume anything. This was the t-shirt I wanted to wear today. Um, I chose something a little more, I guess, suitable for the audience. Um, never assume anything. So never assume that you know where the problem is, where it's coming from, what the cause is, and that everything else around you is working. Um, doing that will often lead you down a path of frustration and anger and all of those things we talked about before where you can't find the problem because you're not actually looking in the right place. There's a reason why things are done certain ways. As as annoying and as, and, and as irritating as they are to um, people in our profession. So who here has a home internet connection? Right. Who here has had to call their ISP with an issue? I expect to see no hands go down at this point in time. Um, and who here started to get a little pissy when the ISP told them to do an isolation test? Do you know why they told you to do an isolation test? Because, sorry? And that is right. And when you never actually do it and you say you've done it and you have to walk through the process and things like that, the isolation test, like the, you, the person at the end of the phone is, is probably not a skilled person. They are reading from a script. And they have a flow chart that they're following. But that was written by a person who knows the problem or what the series of problems can be. And um, I've been absolutely guilty of this. Internet connection working up for seven months goes down. 
straight on the phone to the ISP, what did you guys do? I didn't change anything. Well, actually, I did. One of my ADSL filters failed, and I didn't know. And I did an isolation test before I called. And all of those things, so that there is a reason why there's a process behind these things. As frustrating, as irritating as it is, if you get back to basics and you rule things out straight away, you can start to find the problem. Um, so you be systematic with your approach, right? So here we go. Here's how we find problems. Is it reproducible? Can you trigger it? Typically, if you can trigger it, you can locate it very quickly. That's step number one. Do I know how to cause this? If I know how to cause it, I can usually wrap up in a very nice, neat little bundle where things are. If it's not reproducible, if it's intermittent, if it's random, you get back to basics. Um, there have been times where I've been trying to configure a system and I've, I've done failed the first test, which was, I assume, things. Um, and then the second thing, I'm, I'm trying to test network connectivity between two systems and you know, pushing things up and I'm getting port failures and, and stuff like that. And anyway, I get down to it where I, where I take a step back. How about a ping test? Can I ping that system? Why didn't I do that first? Because I couldn't. Um, and I took it a step further. Can I ping myself? No, I couldn't. Hmm. There's something here that's wrong that I'm not even looking for that's causing me serious pain. So you need to be, you need to, to, to break it down into its simplest, smallest possible things, just the common things. What's everything I'm using? What are the simple things I can rule out? Check your logs. So if you've got basic operation, you've, you've gone through your basics and everything's all crappy, have a look in your logs. Most of them are usually lines and lines and lines and lines of nerdy information. Some of it are irrelevant, some of it's noise, and it can be hard work analyzing these things. But it is a good source of information. You can usually find, like most of the time I'm checking logs, I'm checking installation logs um, and looking for a failure error. And uh, like the OS's system install log actually has everything in one place. and so. If software update's doing something in the background and CASP is doing something, and it can get a little ugly and messy to try and trace back where you are, but it's a, it's a good source of information. You can at least find the thing that it is actually erroring, and you can trace it through from there. But you must be methodical. And the reason why I say this is when you don't have, like, if the logs are not giving you any information, if the logs at the other end are not giving you any information, you need a process. Sorry, I like this process. It's, it's a very accurate process. It's a useful process. Um, people need to, to actually follow this process. <laughs> but it was a simple flowchart that I thought was amusing. Sorry, guys. All right. You rule things out. You isolate them. Um, I'll, I'll sort of delve into a, an issue I had a, um, a, a while ago, which was um, Wi-Fi configuration profiles, not working. Certificate-based authentication, AD certs, configuration profile push, APNS is working, Casper's in the mix, client systems are all good, everything looks fine. No error logs at either end, just simple failures. I'm not getting a whole lot of love here. Um, different bits of information being the second or the third to look at the problem, getting, like having to analyze all the precursory data from others. Um, so my, my simple process was I, I started isolation testing components. I started ruling things out. I removed Casper from the mix. I did it with Profile Manager. I then removed the client environment from the mix. I did it with a clean system, just pushing, like, the configuration. I then started to eliminate other items out of the deployment process or the workflow process or the image standardization of that particular customer. And eventually I came down to it and I got to the point where I was, I was scratching my head and it was driving me nuts. Um, and I thought, I'm going to have to take all of this out and rebuild it. Um, so all of the configuration stuff that could potentially do this, because I was never I'm not the first person to look at this, I was not the first person to maintain the system. Um, so it had come to me over time with 
predecessors there. And there were things in there that I didn't understand what they were doing. Um, or I didn't know their purpose. And I was, I was starting to f feel like the, the, the best way to do this was to nuke it. And then I started going, all right, so if I'm to build a fresh configuration for this thing, let's put everything in profiles, let's do this. And I go through and I find two Wi-Fi profiles, oh, sorry, uh, two profiles delivering AD certs based on the machine name. One of them has a deny rule on it. And because there's no order of precedence for profiles, this is why it was an intermittent fault. Because occasionally it was reading the certificate that it wasn't allowed to use. Now, that's, that's a, it's kind of an awful problem to have, but I had to be systematic. I had to start chopping things out of it until I eventually got there. Um, so a really good technique for this is called split half searching. If I'm to say split half search, does anyone know what I'm talking about here? OK, good, some people. Um, a, a brief explanation. You start. I'm going to use letters, right? We've got the letters from A to Z. I'm thinking of a letter. Is it before or after M? So you can eliminate yourself, like you can eliminate half of your search range straight off the cuff. Then we can split it in half again. Do the same thing. So you iterate this down till you get to the point where you've got an individual test that you can target. It is a fairly simple, common sense style approach to these things. Um, and I cannot stress exactly how important having the methodical, logical approach is where you can just start taking things away. Start getting rid of the red herrings, the unknown variables, um, all of those bits and pieces. Now, this is, this is like all about approaching your problem and, and dealing with your, like, just trying to find out what it is. We still haven't talked about solving it. So rule number one, if you can, um, the amount of times I have been guilty of myself or seen other people do it, making the change in the production environment without testing it first. It is scary how often this sort of stuff happens. Um, and the mess it can cause is horrifying. It was, uh, someone mentioned it earlier today, uh, deploying to everyone. Was that you, Stu? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so a test environment is very good um, because you've isolated your problem, you can make it reproducible, all of those things, so you can start testing your fix at that point in time. Unfortunately, if you can't replicate it, you might be stuck in this. Um, and it's not a great place to be, and you need to be very, very careful when you're doing it here. Um, and I, I've just realized exactly how fast I've ripped through all of this. <laughs> Yeah, the timer wasn't running beforehand. I'm sure we can do one more thing at the tail end of it. Um, so if you've got to work in your production environment, this is the time that you start being very, very careful and very particular about what you do. Number one step. Um, something that I actually forgot to include in this, but I was reminded about by a gentleman sitting in the corner. Um, document every change you are going to make as you do it. This is very, very important because there are several reasons. Um, if you make the change, if it changes nothing, if nothing happens, you need to remember exactly what you just previously did. Don't stack them. One at a time, please, people. Revert your change immediately. Don't leave it there. <laughs> Otherwise, you introduce another variable, or potentially, you have introduced another problem. And that's when the pressure starts to increase, because there's now more people who are pissed off. And they're at you, as in, why do I have this problem? What did you just do? And you have to know, what did you just do? Revert it immediately. And this is one of my favorite statements. Remember, when you make a change and you roll it back, it's not no change, it's two. Be very conscious of that. So you, you need to be very, very cautious with that sort of behavior. 
And this is why we document it. And this is why we roll it back. This is, I, I know I'm sounding preachy. I know I'm sounding obvious. But when we're under pressure, we forget to do these things. And it's all about remembering, remaining calm, being meticulous, getting help. Help is a good thing to get, but you need to use it wisely. I have had situations where people have gone and looked for information and they've got eight tabs open on their browser and they're going through forums and they're looking for their problems and, and um, oh, to, where to start? They forget which one they were working on. They all kind of look the same when you start looking in the technical, uh, the, the techie or the nerdy ones, the troubleshooting ones, particularly if you're writing code. Um, so this is the Stack Overflow icon for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, there are definitely plenty of others, but if you click on the wrong one and then you start deviating from the process that you were following, that can end badly. So work with a single source of information at a time. Only display your single source of information at a time. Tabs are not great in this scenario. Windows are great in this scenario. Just a simple technique thing, because you can put everything else in one window with all of its tabs open and minimize it so it's out of your way, but you only have one thing in front of you. The other thing with forums is, um, if you're looking at them, does anyone know how to read one? When you, you're looking through support forums and help forums, where do you start? at the bottom, and you work backwards. You look for the first thank you. <laughs> that worked for me. You go back and you find out what was that thing. Never ever start at the beginning and start working through it because all you're going to do is introduce change after change after change that didn't solve the problem. And some of these things can go on for about 30 pages. <laughs> um, it's like I said, it's a simple, simple, simple common sense approach. If you call someone, one person at a time, please. I have been in scenarios where I've realized I'm helping someone and somebody else is helping that person too. And we were unaware of this. Or actually, we, we became aware of it very quickly because we happened to be sitting next to each other at that point in time. So we had a little bit of fun with it. But, but that kind of scenario can end incredibly badly. So it's very, very important that you work with a single source of information while you are doing this sort of thing. You know, it's, it's a common sense approach. If I, I sort of recap through all of the things, be methodical, isolate your problem, rule things out, work out how to repeat it, work in a sandbox test environment. Be careful where you get your information from, make sure you're being consistent when you do it. Do it in the correct order. Read everything first. Don't try stuff after reading half the solution. Read through it. Understand it top to tail. Know what you are doing. Know how to reproduce your problem. Know how to solve your problem. Do all of these things outside of your production environment. Do not adhere to the pressure you are going to get. Um, therein lies the path of madness and pain. And this is a big one. Um, I'd like to call out, uh, I've got my better half of the company here, um, or actually the better parts of the company here this week. Um, so I'd like to call out Justin, who has always been the voice of reason for me, is knowing when to put things down, when to stop doing it. If you work on a problem and you're there like first thing in the morning and you're, you're working through it really, really hard, everyone's screaming at you, why is it all down, the world is ending, well, nobody's actually dying. You know, roll back to that way. Um, but work, work into it from there and think, am I functioning correctly as a human being? Am I looking after myself here? Am I really an effective problem solver when I haven't slept and I've been on this for 18 hours looking at a screen? Trying things, getting frustrated, getting pressure, getting distracted, going through it. You need to know when to call it. You need to know when to put it down. There are scenarios where if you go home and you get a minimum of four hours sleep and you have a shower and everyone goes, where the fuck's he going? It's a good idea because you won't do anything in that next four hours. And you come back and you can finally, you know, 
have a look at it with a clearer mind, a fresher set of eyes, a little break, it's important. Like, I mean, get up, walk around the block, go for a coffee, um, anything, but you need to know when to call it. You need to know when to walk away from it and to, to, to put it down for a little while. Um, I'm currently working on an issue with deploying, uh, does anyone deploy Pro Tools here? Um, yes, Cameron knows my issue. <laughs> Um, that uh, an issue with, with Pro Tools, and I've been banging my face against this for about a week and a half now. Um, it's, it's a really, really difficult task because I don't know where the problem is. I am having a lot of trouble finding it. I'm systematically walking through it. It's not a little task to test, and I have other things to do. Um, but I know when to put it down. I've given myself time frames for looking at this thing. It's no more an hour than an hour at a time because if you're going to look at Perl code, um, that's about enough time to look at any Perl coders here. Yeah, um, Perl was once described to me as a real man's language. Um, you, you can write entire blocks of code in nothing but punctuation. Um, um, and, and it's horrible. Um, but, and there's, there's a fi finite amount of time that you can effectively look at something like that um, and, and understand it. And after that, it just, just looks like a blur of like, like someone face planted on the shift key and the, the numeric, uh, sorry, the number keys at the top of the keyboard. Um, that's, that seems to be what it's like all the time. And if you sort of, you put all of those things together and you know when to walk away and you do all of that sort of stuff and you approach it freshly and things like that, you'll find that having that break or having that leverage from it will actually help you solve the problem quicker, particularly if it's an ongoing one. Um, so that's kind of the end. Um, I ripped through it, it was preachy. Joel made a joke about it sort of filling seven minutes, he was right. <laughs> um, do I have any questions? about approaches, techniques. You're gonna grab the mic. How do you decide when to call it? When I look at it and I go, am I doing something that I just did an hour ago? Am I doing that again and expecting a different response? Interestingly enough, there are occasionally times where you can fire stuff off and get different responses every time. Um, they're the worst kind of problems. <laughs> Um, when you do the same thing over and over again and get a different answer, because it is actually the definition of insanity to expect a different answer, doing the same stuff over and over again. Um, and when you change nothing and things are going on, that usually means that somebody else is changing something and you don't know about it. Uh, do you want to maybe give a, sort of a more um, practical explanation of um, something where you've done split half troubleshooting um, for people that weren't aware of it? Um, that might sort of, you know, somewhere where you've used that in, in, in context to isolate a problem? Um, yeah, sure, why not? Um, so the, typically the, the split half, well actually I'll, I'll highlight the process. Is it hardware or is it software? Um, and that's, that's the first thing because that's, that's half of your environment there. And once, once you divvy up whether it's hardware you can Pull it, pull it into a class. Is it the, the client system or is it the server side? Unfortunately, there's, you can't really split half that. You've got to go three ways because you end up client system networking infrastructure and, um, and server side. But you, you get the general picture. You can rule out several things at a time um, or great chunks of things at a time and then you drill into it further down from that. But I'm not a hardware guy. I'm actually not allowed to touch screwdrivers because every time I do something breaks, um, I'm, I'm a software guy, so when um, troubleshooting a problem, it, um, particularly I use it a lot when I'm writing code. Um, so I, I would write a piece of code to do something, you screw it up the first time, you usually do. Um, then you have a look at that piece of code and work out what it is that went wrong, where, where it was that went wrong, like by saying, okay, was it the thing I was trying to do or was it the execution? So if it was the execution, it could be code syntax. If it was the thing I was doing wrong, then it was a logical error. So I've, I've determined whether or not it's an actual error in the code or it's a logical error. And then I drill into that further based on that. If it's a logical error, what did I do? What did I intend to do? So where was my intent? Where was my result? And I drill it down again, a layer from that. Um, 
Now, I, I do take this with a, a little bit of a grain of salt because a lot of, lot of the time, like I was saying, you skip ahead. There is, like, there's a whole bunch of troubleshooting theories, and I was reading into a heap of them, uh, about using the weight of experience to determine which things that you should be going after. Um, but therein lies a little bit of an assumption path as well. And so you have to be careful when you do that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, like, educated guesses are good, um, and maybe that's the first thing that you try and rule out, something like that. Because, yes, we, with a, an ecosystem as big as what we deal with, um, there are a lot of moving parts that you need to test. Uh, Duncan, just uh, it strikes me that certain stakeholders might react uh, in a negative fashion when you tell them you're going back to basics to diagnose something. Is there any particular like uh, like uh, I have no group of skills. phrases um, <laughs> or something like that you use to position that sort of approach when they might assume that you should know instinctively exactly where the issue lies? Um, yeah, this this sort of comes down to psychology and people skills, uh, most of which I don't have. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I tend to not sugarcoat stuff, and I, I like to tell it like it is, um, which never really works in my favour. Um, but the the thing is that you you have to appeal to the sensibilities of them. You know, are, are you effective at the end of an eighteen hour day? Is usually a good question. Do you even do an eighteen hour day? Can you even know where I'm coming from? Um, a good one is, do you have kids? Because you get home and you get that, and this is a person who probably, if they have small kids, is a per person who probably hasn't slept for four years. Um, so just things like that. You try and... Um, the, the thing that... Um, uh, that Ben was talking about, about having, like, or that was in Ben's presentation about empathy. You need to get them to establish empathy with you. So you need to pitch why you're slowing down and why you don't know why the, what the problem is. Um, because that's, like, I mean, that's part of the process for doing these things. And if you, you know, they, they perceive it as you're wasting time, but you might find a problem very quickly. Um, so, you know, I, when I was, was talking about doing the ping tests and things like that, um, let me put that in perspective for you. The problem had been going on for a week and going through all sorts of things at very high levels and within the application layer and all of those things did not occur to me to get right back down to that layer and start there until then. When I did, I isolated the problem really quickly, but no clear mind. Um, so, so this is, this is why the, the basics are very important. They're very good because quite often you can find that the basics will lead you to the solution quite quickly. Um, and they don't actually take that long. Like the worst case scenario is if they yield nothing, you're probably going to add an hour to your troubleshooting time and nothing is that critical. Well, nothing I deal with anyway. Um. Okay, well, thanks very much, Duncan. No worries. Okay.